Hello and welcome to Testimony Time with me, Del Barefoot. It's a delight today to have in the studio with us Colin Murray from Port Sawyer, which is a fishing village in Scotland. He's just written a book called Papering Over the Cracks, and this is a very poignant uh, title because he's actually a painter and decorator by trade and by business, but also papering over the cracks is something that we all tend to do, even in our Christian lives sometimes, and it's a... Uh, he takes us in this book on an emotional journey, but he does it with total transparency. He's laid himself bare and opens up his heart as he brings his story, and I'm hoping that he will do that today. So welcome, Colin, to the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Dale. Tell us a little bit, Colin, about your childhood in Scotland, and particularly the great van robbery that uh, I read about. Yeah, well, I'd, uh, I would say I had a very happy upbringing in, in Port Soy, um, very loving parents, good parents. Um, they weren't the church going parents, but I uh, was brought up within the boundaries of a Christian home. Mm. And uh, yeah, I got into a bit of bother, a bit of mischief. <laughs> uh, I had an impulsive nature, uh, <clears throat> a craving to be liked, to be accepted. And I think that. Uh, that kind of manifested itself in some of the bother I got into and unfortunately some of it was with the police <laughs> and uh, I dare say to my regret even to this day that I caused my parents a lot of worry uh, with my behaviour and uh, I suppose the great van robbery came when I, I started working, started serving my time as a painter and decorator and I was going to college in Aberdeen I think it was about 16 or 17 at the time and uh, a friend of mine and myself were out for our lunch and we were coming back from our lunch and uh, a big brown box fell out the back of a, a lorry and it was coming away from, the, from an electrical store and uh, it just landed in the middle of the road and I know that sticks a bit of believing but this is, <laughs> uh, this is true God. <clears throat> this is me being honest and uh, it landed in the middle of the road and of course us being the good Samaritans we decided we would take it back to the electrical store and uh, but unfortunately the store was was closed for lunch so we took it upstairs to our our class and uh, we told our teacher about it and and he suggested we take it back in the in the afternoon afternoon lunch break uh, so a uh, tea break sorry and uh, and we did take it back, but they weren't in. The gist of the story is we got involved with another couple of guys and they persuaded us to keep it and that uh, we, could, we could sell it and make a bit of money. And I've, of course, I was um, kind of influenced by them. And is, so they actually attempted to sell it in Aberdeen over the weekend and uh, the, the gist of what happened was when we came back in the Monday morning, uh, the police car was waiting for us at the college uh, to take us away to get fingerprinted and charged with this uh, charge of theft by finding. Uh, so that was one of two or three uh, sort of misdemeanors I got yes, in, in my youth. You were in big trouble then. Yeah. Now in 1982, you received some devastating news concerning your mum, Margaret. Yeah. Um, how did that affect you? Just, just to tell our viewers what that was and how it affected you and your family family at that time? Um, I think my mum was the rock of the, the family, the, the glue, the cement that kept mm. the family together. And when she was diagnosed with cancer, she was only 46. And in my naivety, I didn't think that breast cancer, the type of cancer it was, was life-threatening. And uh, she went into remission, and then unfortunately the cancer came back. And then when she died, Two years later, at the age of 47, uh, we were devastated, myself, my younger mm. brother Keith, but more so my father. My father was a very deep and sensitive man, mm. and he was quite a heavy drinker, and uh, he took it badly. Of course, I took it badly because I was close to my mom. I had a close relationship with her, so it was a very mm. devastating time for us. Mm. Now, in your book, uh, in your autobiography, you speak about your own drinking even gambling 
and also the scariest moment in your life when you took super strength skunk some of our viewers may not know what that is but it, it is a drug yeah and how did you get into the whole drug sk drug scene well i was never heavily involved in drugs i was more a drinker a weekend drinker maybe a binge weekend drinker but uh, i ended up down at some of my relatives, down in a place called Blythe in the northeast of England, beside Newcastle. And we ended up at a nightclub, and I think we were offered uh, some of this cannabis. And uh, I had never really smoked much. Uh, cigarettes made me dizzy, so I was mm. never really into cannabis. But I had a few drinks in, I was uh, sort of full of bravado, so I decided to have a, a couple of draws of this. Then I went back to my cousin's house and I had more. And then um, what happened was from a feeling of, of giggliness and silliness that I felt a tingling going through me, mm. uh, I, I started becoming paranoid and I really started to panic. And uh, I thought every, everybody was speaking about me, a dog was going to attack me and it was a horrible situation. And I went up to my bed to, to lie down, but I couldn't sleep. I just kept on getting this reoccurring panic attacks and this went on for several hours and it was just a horrible experience mm. and uh, I've never been so glad to see morning again it really was mm. a real lesson for me it was a mm. bad experience mm. now you you share um, quite candidly about your, your dad Bill yeah. and how he was a heavy drinker and the fact that he was drinking because he was depressed and of course alcohol is a depressant yeah. and nothing really could have prepared you for the discovery that you made on the 9th of June 1992. Could you just share, Colin, some of that awful, dreadful experience? Uh, <clears throat> well, this was four years after my uh, mum had died, and it was a real, again, there was um, bits of positivity. My father had stopped drinking for the best part of a year, but he went back drinking again, and uh, I came home from my work one evening. I'd actually moved to my own house but I checked up on him every night uh, just to see that he was okay. We had argued a bit the, the, the night before but that never made any difference to the promise I made him that I would uh, pop up and see him every night so uh, I drew up to the house and I and I entered the house and I, f I found him there in the kitchen and he'd taken his own life and it was a horrific experience. He'd hanged himself? Yeah he'd hanged himself yes. My goodness. That's unbelievable, isn't it? And uh, how did you deal with your emotions and your feelings um, following that? I mean, you, you described the guilt, the shame, the helplessness, the anger, yeah. the hurt that you felt, because after all, your dad is your childhood hero. Absolutely. Um, how did you cope with those emotions? I think I just sort of buried myself in work and just, I don't know if you can ever get over it, if it was ever a case of getting over it, but you just, over a period of time, you, you come to terms with it. Mm. And I just sort of buried myself in an avalanche of work, mm. and I just um, thought that it was, it was my problem, and mm. it was my issue, it was our family issue, yeah. and it was up to me personally to deal with it. So you internalised it? Yes, and, I believe and I internalised it by throwing yourself into to working incredibly hard in your painting and decorating yeah. business. Um, that, to some extent, desensitized you and you could yes. focus on your work and, yeah, and so correct, on. Yeah. So there was a distraction. But, yeah. but uh, did you allow yourself time to grieve? Uh, not naturally, no. Mm. I don't feel I did yeah. because there was all the pent up emotions as you've yes. described, like anger and guilt, the fact that we often had a strained relationship, yes. and of, of, of course the shame as well, can the shame of, and the stigma, the stigma. of that. that well, type you, so of you death. were blaming yourself, Colin. Yes, I was. And yeah. saying this must be my fault, the fact that we'd argued, or yeah. you were trying to justify this unpredictable act by, by, by something that you'd actually done. Now, you were running a successful painting and decorating business. You got into network marketing, and that proved very successful for you. You were reading a lot of self-help books. Yeah. Um, did they help you, Colin? And, and if so, in, in what way did they, did they help you? Uh, they did help me in a sense. Uh, and after a period of time, I got drawn to more of the Christian-based one, 
ones from America and I started mm. uh, reading books by Robert Schuller and John Maxwell, the, the business leader. And what, how I think they helped me was for the first time in my life, began to take my eyes off myself and start focusing on the needs of other people. Mm. There was still a, a bit of material wealth uh, that was promoted in some of these books. And I think it was a bit of the prosperity mm. gospel that we of, often see in America. And I was a bit seduced by that as well. Mm -hmm. But it, it was more uh, the concept of helping other people for the first time. Yeah. And you went on a trip to Amsterdam and yeah. it really touched your heart deeply, didn't it? The experience that you had, what you saw. Can you just share with the viewers the way that, that God was speaking to you really in your heart uh, in terms of compassion for some of those folks out there? Yeah, well, there was two instances. Um, I actually booked into a, a, a small like dingy bed and breakfast in the red light district. Mm. Uh, so me being me, I decided to go a tour of the red light district. Mm. And uh, it was late at night and it was da obviously dark and drizzly. And um, I got propositioned by some prostitutes mm. uh, that were there and something came over me. It was just as if there was a presence there saying um, that, again, that this was awful, this was evil mm. and this wasn't right. And I was also confronted by a massive church, and it was a it was a strange paradox seeing the church there in mm. the middle of this red light district, and and I was sort of confused by that. And then the following day, um, I ended up uh, at Anne Frank's house. Uh, it was a very sort of moving experience, very emotional experience as well, seeing where that young girl mm. and her family went through in the Second World War. Mm. So that had a that was a significant time in your yeah, life. I think and, so, yeah. And you were sensing for all the so-called success that you had in your business and with the network work marketing and with you had a flat by in by this time uh, in Tenerife. Yeah, that's right. Um, most people looking at you would have said, Colin's got a really great life, but <laughs> nevertheless, you weren't feeling fulfilled. You were feeling an emptiness and, and a void in your life. And you describe yourself in the book as an octopus on roller skates, <laughs> which uh, conjures up a wonderful image. Um, tell us about your introduction to, to Alpha and to Nikki Gumbel. How did that come about? 